You're watching Essential Oils 101 by Dr. Alyssa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Whole Life Medicine Alleviate series. Keep in the loop about future webinars and events on whole-life-medicine.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Essential Oils 101. My name is Dr. Alyssa Gall, and I'll be your host and guide this evening about all things smelly. <laughs> As usual, um, this webinar is brought to you um, out of the Alleviate series. So Alleviate is the first step in the whole life medicine approach to patient guidance. And as we've spoken about before, it's a step where we're looking at root causes and detoxification and the potential for missing components that our body needs to heal. Today, we're obviously talking about remedies and essential oils are a category of remedy that can be really supportive in our health strategies. Um, they can be used with a clean slate process and in, in a detox process, and they can support missing ingredients and be involved in problem-specific problem programs in very specific ways. So we're going to cover a, a lot today. <laughs> I tried to rein it in a little tiny bit. Um, and so what I always realize every time we talk about a modality like this is that we can certainly cover some highlights in this next hour or so but really it's it's a much nicer um idea to have an opportunity to really spend some time together to go through how to use essential oils properly and so um i'm actually going to propose that we do a more formal course i have taught um courses in essential oils in the past uh, back when we had a classroom to do that in and where people used to be more willing to come on a Saturday morning. Um, but we all treasure our time and our space nowadays. And so everything really has gone online. And so we will, um, I'm going to show you a new course offering for essential oils that's going to happen here in mid August. So um, if you find yourself excited about learning about essential oils and you want to know more details, um, I really encourage you to um, to spend some time with me and and really do just that. It's it's like learning homeopathy or learning herbal medicine or learning nutrition. You know, it takes takes a fair amount to become really competent. But you know, what I find is in when we have the chance to do a, a more detailed course, people can quickly find confidence um with learning some of these modalities and when you have more confidence you're more likely to use it you're more likely to benefit from it so hopefully i will convince you to spend another probably it's going to probably be about three hours i'm planning for two sessions um probably about an hour and a half each and we'll we'll I'll talk to you a little bit more about the details towards the end of this presentation but again you know every time I come up against one of these things where I'm trying to encapsulate the use of um uh like a whole a whole group of remedies it's it's really difficult to do it justice and um I'm sure that's one of the reasons why all of you are even on this call is because you can realize that it takes a little bit of time and, and doing to really understand how to most use, like how to, how to get the best use out of these sorts of things. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, we will dive right in. And I thought we'd start um, a bit about history. Um, because I've seen it said that essential oils have been used for thousands of years and and kind of that's true, but not in the way that we actually think. So um, the use of herbal applications that have essential oils in the herbs has been obviously found for several millennia. But essential oils are not the same then as what you would expect from a modern essential oil. So modern essential oils are the result of steam distillation. And that really results in a really concentrated form of volatiles from plant materials. So the use of herbs, of course, is deeply rooted throughout cultures around the world for um, healing purposes, for religious purposes, 
for many cultures throughout time, religious and healing purposes wouldn't be considered separate. For example, you know, as early as 4500 BC, Egyptians used aromatic oils and pastes from plants, but normally they were extracted using heat and animal fat. So those were made into topical applications. Um, they even transformed them into pills as early as, as 4500 BC, you know, and many were originally resins, like myrrh is a great example, or frankincense is a great example. There was a huge spice road that ran from, from modern day Oman to Israel. That was like where frankincense was, was traveling across the desert. Um, they were very commonly incorporated into perfumery and into cosmetic products for the Egyptians. And um, they became masters of extraction, but like I said, not in the modern sense. They, they mostly put plant materials into oils and then used heat in a closed vessel to pull or solubilize those essential oils into a fatty character. Um, and of, of course they would have often been using not just plant oils, but animal oils, um, mostly because animal oils can fix the scent um, more reliably than plant um, oils can. So the use of herbal oils was definitely recorded in China um, before uh, 3000 BC. Um, and incorporating oils into healing products is very common in Ayurveda, that's traditional Indian medicine. In fact, one of my favorite Ayurvedic remedies is nausea oil, which is essential oils and a carrier oil that is put um, up into the nose. Um, long story there. <laughs> Ayurvedic medicine is a whole other category of, of medicines that you can use that have their own intelligence system behind them. Um, the Greeks adopted knowledge of fatty extracts from the Egyptians and um, Roman soldiers and Greek soldiers often carried um, ointments into battle to counter infections. And it was super customary for the Romans to use the herbs this way, um, also in massage and baths because the Romans were famous for baths and they were using herbal um, constituents. And um, it wasn't though until about about a thousand years ago that steam distillation of herbs was invented and it was invented in Iran um, using equipment for alcohol distillation. So I'm showing you here a picture of a distillation apparatus made out of um, clay. And so this would have been an early distillation. So on the right hand side there, well, in the middle, you see that, um, that tube that goes between one vessel and another. So the vessel on the right would have had fire underneath it. Um, and so the pots would be simmered in that bottom pot over a, a small fire and the steam would come up into that cone apparatus. And um, so you actually get a fair amount of movement within an apparatus like that. That's kind of like an internal fountain almost. So like the steam comes up, it hits the very top of that conical structure. And some of it would actually, um, because the difference in temperature between the bottom vessel and the top vessel, would condense and run down that tube, which is at an angle, and then land in that bowl. And it's, it was a way of extracting the volatiles and the smelly things out of plants. It's also a way of extracting alcohol because alcohol actually evaporates much more quickly than water. And so you could take a mash that had alcohol in it and distill it down um, by like basically vaporizing the alcohol. And then when it hits a cold surface, it's, it goes down. Now, and in 1000 AD, um, it was actually Avicenna. So that's, um, that's the, English, the anglicized version of his name. He was a Persian physician. He figured out that you could cool the tube in between those two vessels and, um, and really get much more of the essential oil components out of it. So people have always been fascinated with perfumery and using plants and trying to preserve plants. Um, when I was a little girl, my grandmother had a mint patch and it was a beautiful smelling mint not you know like stinky field mint it was it was really a beautiful um mint she had growing in a patch and i tried like crazy to get that plant smell into water i was going to make my own perfume <laughs> and of course that didn't work out very well because 
you know, at eight, you don't realize all the chemical constituents of perfumery. <laughs> um, it's kind of a bummer. I wish I would have known then what I know now. Um, so, so as you can see, you know, there's a rich history of aromatic, um, topical, and oral um, plant extract use. And like I said, to the for, for a very long time, that really was more crude extracts than what we're used to. We're basically getting this incredibly concentrated product from the kind of distillations that we're doing nowadays. So that's a kind of little brief overview of how that's developed. Now, there are plenty of benefits of essential oils, um, but what I would probably do is I'm gonna categorize them kind of roughly in two major categories. Um, and lots of subcategories are gonna apply under this, but I want you to kind of think about it in two ways. The, the first is that essential oils um, are often very applicable to infections. So basically re-regulation of the microbiome, changing the bacterial populations. Um, they are not like antibiotics in the sense that they completely kill everything in enough of uh, concentration. Um, they, they don't work like that, really. And then the other major category for which they're incredibly useful is they have um, big interactions with the nervous system. And part of that is through the limbic system of the brain because your sense of smell actually feeds up at the very top of your nose um, into a, the cranial nerve that's the olfactory um, bulb. And it actually is routed right through the reptilian brain, that part of your brain that's very instinctual. And so the thought is that this is where a lot of the effect of um, essential oils and aromatherapy is really coming from. It's coming from the stimulation of these particular centers in the, in the brain. Now, essential oils can be extracted from all sorts of plant por parts. So we tend to think about it as being flowers, but it can be leaves. It can You can also get essential oils from barks or um, like cinnamon bark is a great example or roots or the resin, like we talked about myrrh and frankincense and um, peels, peels of things like citrus peels. And what you're doing is you're distilling to separate the oily compounds from the water-based compounds. And I'm not gonna go into this too much um, in this introductory lecture, but there are very specific structures in plants that um, produce and emit those essential oils. And they're very important in plant physiology. Um, and this is part of the reason why they can also be harmful. Like they can be harmful to your pets, as an example. Um, and we'll go through a couple of um, particular examples for cats and dogs later in the lecture. So, but in any case, from what we're going to look at in terms of the following benefits is we're going to look at how they might possibly help us hormonally. And again, there's complex brain interplay here. Um, and also digestively, you know, you can improve your hormones by improving your digestion. They certainly have an impact on digestion when ingested. Um, they can have an effect on immunity and obviously antimicrobials and antivirals. Um, it's probably one of the only categories of um, like herbs really are one of the main categories that you can actually have an antiviral coming out of herbs. Like it's incredible really when you think about it. We have barely anti <laughs> any antivirals, you know, in the pharmacy um, of the traditional conventional medicines. There's quite a few antiviral effect essential oils. Um, we're also going to talk about how they stimulate digestion, about how they decrease mental fatigue, about how they can improve brain performance and reduce stress and anxiety um, and potentially improve sleep, um, alleviating inflammation or pain, enhancing skin repair and hair growth, improving lung function, um, improving headache and migraine um, symptomatology. So really a, a very broad um, application of various types of essential oils. So let's just start um, kind of at the top of our list. We can talk about certain things that will balance hormones. Um, now I wanna 
I want to caution I want to caution people about using these in high doses. We're going to talk about what's a, what is appropriate dosing as a kind of general ballpark. Again, depends on your condition and your age um, and what else is going on with you, how big of a dose of essential oils you can really tolerate. This is definitely not one of those times where more is necessarily better. <laughs> so I know there's some people who just love to coat themselves in essential oils, um, but they can have their impacts as well. So first, for case first, adrenal glands. So we've talked about adrenal um, uh, glands in the past in uh, other webinars. And if you'll recall, the adrenal glands help us cope with stress um, by producing um, primarily the hormone cortisol. There's uh, many other hormones that the adrenals are responsible for helping with. But when cortisol levels are in balance, you can really be left feeling fatigued, even if you've had full nights of sleep. You can have trouble remaining calm. Um, you can experience brain fog. You can feel also feel on the opposite end of that, very agitated. And um, there's actually a very nice essential oil. And again, the herb works as well, but the essential oil has um, a more targeted effect, um, which is basil or basil. So it's a particular type of basil. And this is another thing um, that we're going to find as we're working through some of these examples you're, you're going to find that there's different effects from different um, subspecies of the same pl like plant, technically. So the best um, basil to use for adrenal fatigue is the large leaf basil essential oil. Um, it has the, the best mix for the support of an adrenal gland. So it just helps you increase your natural response to this to the stress. Um, it makes you feel more relaxed. Um, and mixing a few drops with coconut oil and rubbing it into your forearms or the cartilage, kind of where your earlobes are, helps bring balance to your adrenals. There's a relationship between your ears and the kidney adrenal system. And so it's a nice place to rub. And it smells very, very nice this particular essential oil. Some of them do not smell so nice, <laughs> but this one definitely does. Um, the subspecies that works the best, like I said, is large leaf basil. The French name or the, uh, you sometimes will see this marked on, on basil, they'll say foie de laitue, it's French. <laughs> and it'll actually be marked like that. So in thyroid dysfunction, you can also, um, have some nice aromatherapy. It primarily affects the fatigue um, in thyroid dysfunction. It doesn't necessarily change the metabolism greatly, but it certainly helps the fatigue. And that is the oil palmarosa. So um, also you can use that with coconut oil. And if you want to be fancy about it, you can rub it onto your big toes or at the base of your throat. Um, so that's a reflexology tip. Um, seaweed essential oil also helps over the throat. Um, and most people with thyroid conditions, fennel doesn't really suit them. Fennel can be a little bit calming to somebody who has hyperthyroidism, but in hypothyroidism, it doesn't seem to work very well for those people. Now, estrogen progesterone imbalances um, are also very common types of hormone imbalances. And of course, we can see this in things like PMS or low libido or night sweats or hot flashes. And there's a couple of well-known essential oils that work well um, to help in those circumstances. One of them is clary sage. Um, not the most beautiful smelling sage. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had a clary sage plant. They're very interesting plants. I, I have one in my garden and um, it's, it's really kind of unique in comparison to the other like normal sage that you would put on your chickens and turkeys. <laughs> Very different smell to it. Um, also geranium is quite useful. Um, again, there's can be there's quite a few different kinds of geranium. I'm not talking about rose geranium, I'm talking like geranium proper. Um, and so you can basically use those for a myriad of hormonal complaints, and they'll often be found as the base for 
especially female hormone problems. Um, you can also use clary sage um, to relieve pain. I don't know if you know that or not, but like in, especially in joint pain. So you can give that a whirl. So next is a category we can look at boosting immunity and fighting infections. And so many essential oils have very powerful antibacterial and antiviral properties. Um, and some studies actually show that essential oils are just as powerful as the over-the-counter medications for treating infections like skin infections or urinary tract infections. And again, remember that the goal is a positive change in the microbiome. It's not about killing everything that exists. <laughs> I know sometimes, um, you know, we have this kind of concept like we, we're killing everything, but but really we're not killing everything. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, to balance an imbalanced um, microbiome or viral picture or fungal picture because we have all of those organisms in us and trying to coordinate with us but um, a lot of these essential oils can really powerfully help the microbiome to find a little bit better of a balance point so one that everybody knows um, is tea tree oil it's quite antiseptic um, and it can it, it is actually very potent and ideally you would dilute it in water or a carrier oil um, before using it on your skin that will also help actually for you to have a more sustained effect on the skin um, because they're fatty like solvent based almost um, they're kind of like solvents themselves they will absorb quite quickly into the subcutaneous tissue and so it can be a little bit overwhelming and they can be irritating to the tissue so um, diluting it in in something is useful like coconut oil again or almond oil something that's my like that's very mild and you know doesn't bother your skin so there's a lot of um use in tea tree for decreasing the acne causing um bacteria on the skin again not to kill it all off but just to make it a bit more balanced so it's not replicating as well in the hair follicles um, grapefruit oil is another one. So this is not grapefruit seed extract. That's a, that's a different product that's more herbal. But grapefruit essential oil is quite effective for killing off like Staph aurea, Salmonella, and E. coli. So all of those things, so Staph aureus and E. coli are normal flora. There are variants of them that are disease producing, but a lot of the time the disease production is the imbalance and in the groups um, on your own skin or in your own GI tract. Um, but also useful for things that are more pathogenic like salmonella. You can always ingest grapefruit oil. The dose would be about one or two drops in a glass of water. So ideally, if you put it in a little bit of warm water and give it a good vortex spin, you can at least get it enough solubilized that you can get it down. Another way that you can use essential oils is you can put them in another agent that will slowly coat your throat, like um, using honey, if you can tolerate honey, um, or old fashioned way is using like, if, especially if you need a kid to do it, <laughs> you can use those, I, I sometimes use those brown sugar cubes um, that you can get and just put essential oil right into the sugar cube, one or two drops, and then have the person suck on that. It's quite dispersing over the whole oral cavity. It can also be quite strong, you know, especially if you're using something like grapefruit oil. And oregano um, essential oil um, is super effective against, gosh, 20 different strains of E. coli. Um, it can be used uh, topically with coconut oil or another oil. It's very potent. Like a drop really goes a long way. And again, it's about... Um, dispersal um, under those conditions and giving it a chance to really work because it's not like something that kills everything on contact it's it's not like that tea tree is a little bit more like that um, oregano is again a microbiome influencer so you're gonna smell like a pizza but that's all good <laughs> everybody wants to smell like a pizza right now, we can also use a number of essential oils to improve digestion. 
Um, some oils will relieve upset stomach very well in, or indigestion or diarrhea or IBS symptoms. And others kind of stimulate digestive function. So it just stimulates the upper GI to work a little a bit harder and that aid, aids nutrient breakdown and as a result absorption and it decreases irritation. So um, there are many encapsulated versions of essential oils. That used to be something that you almost only ever saw in France. Um, France has a very um, interesting modern history with aromatherapy. They are probably some of the people on the planet that use essential oils um, medicinally um, more than any other country, even within their conventional medical systems. And they're really the people who invented the ingestible peppermint oil pill <laughs> originally. Um, and so you can use the oils internally of ginger and peppermint. You can use the oil of fennel. We can use lemongrass and we can use marjoram. These are all very um, helpful essential oils for digestion and they are best taken internally. Um, you could also topically apply it over the abdomen, you know, several times a day if, if that was more um, appealing to you. But um, really, you know, they're, they're kind of food products anyways. You're, you're gonna eat those anyways, you're adding them adding those types of substances to your cooking anyways. So you might find that that's just easier to take a couple of drops internally. Um, peppermint oil has a very, very good reputation for calming IBS. And like I said, it's one of the ones that you're gonna find encapsulated across Europe um, very consistently. Here, there are encapsulated essential oils we tend to be much more um, cautious and suspicious in North America about anything like that. Um, and for many years, I remember when I was first going to school in the U.S., um, there was a lot of um, uh, pretty, well, pretty significant caution about using essential oils internally. People were just, were not experienced in that and they didn't think that was a good idea. And so for many years, that was kind of something you didn't admit fully out loud that you did but like I said the French had been using them for a, quite a long time um, that way so you can also use essential oils for boosting your energy and really any of the essential oils that are citrusy like orange or grapefruit or lemon um, neroli is this beautiful smell um, mandarin they have properties which are known for boosting mood and energy and they're really boosting the energy um, quite likely through the nervous system, the perception in the nervous system. They just actually improve your mood and as a consequence, you get much better energy from them. There's also ones that are quite refreshing, like eucalyptus oil is very refreshing and it's kind of great for improving or stimulating the energy. Spearmint often helps boost energy levels and it's mild enough for use on kids. Um, and so you could always take one of those kind of energy boosts, ener energy oils, and put it on the back of your neck or in the in a warm bath, or um, diffuse it in the environment. Um, I'm using some essential oils diffused in the office right now <laughs> to improve people's mood a little bit, lift them up a little bit, and also because they have such nice um, viral and bacterial antibacterial effects. So you can also inhale from cotton balls or a bottle. When I went to school, um, we used this, these a lot in the classroom. Keep everybody awake, you know, because we were taking 10 classes per, per quarter and doing clinic rotations. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> we also used some other ones that I'm going to show you here next. Um, and having to do more with improved brain function. So um, when I was in school, we used to always use rosemary while we were studying. So rosemary essential oil, there's an old, um, uh, like, I don't know if it'd be called a wives tale. It's just like this, one of those little clips that you have in English and it's rosemary for remembrance. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but, um, and it, it, it turns out that's quite true. It actually seems to activate um, the memory centers in the brain and improves um, your capacity to remember things. So we would, use rosemary while we were studying it and then we would put it on a Kleenex in the and sniff it during the test 
to see if we could get our brain to remember all of those medical facts. And maybe it worked. I mean, I passed, right? <laughs> I got through medical school. <laughs> so there, there are also super powerful antioxidants in, in some essential oils that can improve cognitive, uh, cognitive function. And there are studies that show that aromatherapy can ease the symptoms of dementia. Um, and the benefit for a dementia patient can also include easing symptoms of anxiety and offering relief from symptoms of depression, improving the quality of life for people living with chronic health conditions. So there's a, uh, also the use if you have maybe not dementia, but processing issues. Cedarwood essential oil has been studied and proven useful for children for ADHD or ADD. And what again, what the, they're doing is they're stimulating the brain's limbic region um, so calming the reptilian brain and frankincense can be used aromatically to improve focus. It minimizes distractions. It improves your concentration. Um, and you can also use patchouli along along and sandalwood, um, for boosting concentration. They've that those have been documented and along along is quite strong. You, you have to be careful with that. That and Jasmine, they're, they're quite, intense. So you just want to be a little careful about how much you use. Patchouli can be like that too. It can be quite overwhelming because um, they're volatiles. And with the sense of smell, um, I know a handful of you are working on the 12 senses meditations right now. And we've discussed um, smell as a, as a sense in our meditations. And smell is a very overwhelming sense. You know, it's something that really comes at you and you can't really escape it and it kind of fills you. So if you do have a scent that's too overpowering, it can be just as much of an agitator as it is a soother. So you have to be careful with some of these such intense compounds in them. Now there's obviously also um, a number of essential oils knowing to reduce stress and anxiety. And some of the best ones are lavender and chamomile, um, bergamot, um, my, one of my personal favorites. I just absolutely adore bergamot oil. Um, again, along along, an orange, geranium, frankincense, um, and vetiver is a very good one. Vetiver is a kind of a weird smell. Um, <laughs> that's spikenard um, in like common name. And I don't know if you've ever used those ones before. It's a very unusual odor, but it's used in a lot of formulas where um, there's a need to reduce anxiety. So you can easily, again, use these in very various applications, putting them in a bath, diffusing them while meditating or doing your yoga, um, adding it to a massage oil. If you're going for massage, um, bringing essential oils to have applied to yourself, um, diluting it with a carrier oil, massaging it on your temple, doing the obvious dilute, like diffusion in some of them, like I said, they just are a little bit interesting smelling. So it depends if you mind your whole environment smelling like that. Now you can also use um, several essential oils to alleviate aches and pains. Um, and you can um, most easily obviously use them topically in dilution. So lavender and peppermint uh, work really well for general aches and pains. Um, in fact, um, it can be marked. I, I don't know if you've ever heard me tell this story, but we have, um, I had, well, I was working with something that was hot in the kitchen and um, it was, a, there was a surface in our popcorn maker. We have one of those stirring oil pop makers, um, popcorn makers. And when you take the tray of it off, there's, there's a metal piece that's quite hot in the base. And when my son was young, I remember saying to him, don't touch that circle, it's hot. And of course, I turned around and he touched the circle. When I turned around, he had his finger up in the air. And that kind of look that comes just before somebody starts wailing. <laughs> and so obviously, you, in a burn, you want to quickly cool the area down. Um, but in essence, we quickly put lavender oil on it. And um, lavender, actually, it turns out, is very, very calming for the autonomic nerves of the skin. So there's a, there's a great number of nerves in your skin that are part of your system of um, pain and muscle tension and um, arterial and venous flow. And so we quickly, you know, cooled it down and put lavender oil on it. And I mean, it went from basically, 
not a great situation to probably within about 15, 20 minutes, he could barely feel the pain at all. And that's been my experience as well. If you're going to burn yourself and you manage to cool it down, slap some lavender oil, even if you've done a fairly good job, a lot of the time the blister doesn't even form. So when you know there were there, I know there would have been several that I would have had that would have blistered. And so um, we actually keep the lavender oil right in the kitchen. Because <laughs> why tempt fate and have to go upstairs, right? And go and get it out of the essential oil cabinet. Um, because yes, I have an essential oil cabinet. I, I have a, a very shallow cabinet with many um, rows on it. And I can just, then I can have all my essential oils in alphabetical order. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it makes it very easy to find them when you're running around needing something. And so Taya is just saying on here, she's using lavender for sunburn and that, that would be the same type of application. So anytime you're in like a neurological kind of pain, lavender will really help a lot. Um, now chamomile essential oil is very good as of, of an analgesic. Um, however, the chamomile essential oil that you want to use is the blue one. So that is, there's two kinds. There's Roman chamomile and German chamomile. And German chamomile is um, uh, blue. And there's a lot of azulene in it. So a fresh um, chamomile oil like that will be navy blue. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, it tends to degrade though, if you don't keep it in cold. Um, the other kind of chamomile is fine. It just doesn't have as, as strong of an anti-inflammatory effect. And it's pretty cool. Like you can put the blue on, the blue oil on, and you'll see it slowly. The, the color will just disappear into your skin. At first you will look blue like a Smurf. <laughs> And then it will just kind of suck in and, and you don't even see it. It just completely disappears into your skin. Lovely, lovely anti-inflammatory. Quite expensive um, to buy. You want to be careful with it. It's not one that you would diffuse. Um, there wouldn't be too much point in that. The Roman chamomile is more commonly used internally digestively. So that's kind of like related to the tea that you would normally drink. You don't get the blue um, from that. It's actually um, a slightly different plant. So, um, and there's arguments in the aromatherapy community about exactly why that happens, but one is yellow and one is most definitely blue. If you get um, chamomile oil and it's turned green, it's already starting to transform away from azulene and it's not going to be as effective. Um, eucalyptus oil is absolutely great for taking the sting out of insect bites and um, Often we'll use rosemary essential oil to reduce muscle soreness. And it smells quite nice, I think. Um, juniper oil is very nice for um, rheumatic conditions or hemorrhoids. Um, juniper has a beautiful smell to it. Of course, this is the berries that are found on the juniper um, uh, evergreens that we very commonly have here in the mountains. Of course, you need a lot of juniper, fresh juniper berries to make the most beautiful thing, um, essential oil. And that is the same flavoring that you taste in gin. Gin is um, an alcohol made out of juniper, or it should have juniper. <laughs> so if you have a certain acre pain, you can certainly um, ask me about that um, if you have your appointment. So brands of essential oil that I use, I actually um, have a wholesaler that I've worked with for a long time. I use Ray, Ray's Downfeast Oils. So um, they have long been my go-to. Um, they source high quality oils around the world and they're pretty um, good at finding things um, that I've needed over the last you know 20 years. Um, Ray unfortunately passed away probably about a decade ago um, of cancer, but she was a wonderful resource and she introduced me to Jeannie Rose. I don't know if you know who that is, but she's um, a PhD botanist who has done a lot of work in the Southern um, United States around essential oils. Um, lovely woman and just a huge storehouse of knowledge about, about essential oils. I was really, really, um, lucky to learn from her. I think she was probably well into her 70s when I last met her, and that would have been about 15 years ago. So I'm not sure if she's still teaching classes or not. And the shelf life of oils really depends a lot on how you treat them. 
if you keep them cool and dark, um, or like in the case, it depends a little bit on the kind of oil, honestly, Holly. Like I said, the chamomile, azaline-based oils, they're pretty delicate and they have to be kept in the freezer. Um, but there are other oils, as long as you keep them, you know, the container closed and in a cool, dark place, they're gonna keep for quite a while. Um, and you'll notice, you know, if you're good at smelling things, you'll notice when they kind of just start to fade a little bit. They're probably freshest in the first couple of years. And then again, depending on how many times you've had the bottle open. Ideally though, you're gonna have um, lots of use out of them and then they're gonna be gone and you're, you're gonna get a new one. <laughs> but I'm certainly, I definitely have sometimes bought too big of an essential oil. Um, there's some that I absolutely love. <laughs> So speaking of which, you know, you can use them for enhancing skin and um, hair growth. And um, I mean, I love, I personally absolutely love rose oil. Like the real rose oil is about $130 a milliliter, um, give or take it. And it's an absolutely gorgeous oil. I, I wear it a lot. Um, and it's a bit, it can actually be a bit overpowering. <laughs> you can really wear too much of it, I think. Um, but it's so beautiful. And when it gets a little cool, you can see little crystals forming in it. It's the most amazing thing. Um, one of the best smells in the world to me anyways. And it has a very good impact on your skin. The problem is that rose oil, the true rose oil, like a appreciatingly expensive, so you're not gonna use that neat on your skin every day. Um, but you can also use rose um, hip oil, like the, the seed oil, and you're gonna have some of that impact. Um, so if you are actually looking to regulate the production of oil on your skin, clary sage will help a lot. It really reduces skin inflammation. It heals up rashes a lot of the time. Um, and if you're looking for enhancing your hair growth, we actually um, have found in the clinic that using essential oils in our hair loss kit has worked really well. So um, studies actually have shown that lavender essential oil is quite effective in promoting hair growth. It's got antimicrobial properties, obviously, so it helps the microbiome on the skin. Sometimes that can be an issue um, in hair growth and it can be really used to soothe the scalp and heal the dry skin. Um, Rosemary is probably the top essential oil for hair thickness and growth. Um, and one study even compared the results of rosemary oil to minoxidil. So that's, you know, like Rogaine base <laughs> products, um, which is a conventional topical hair loss treatment. And the results that report the two work equally as well. So if you mix um, rosemary oil with equal parts olive oil and massage it into the scalp and let it sit for three or four hours before you rinse it out, um, that works really well. And this is, like I said, it's part of our hair loss kit. We we have um, a hair growth um, encouraging kit that uses herbal rinses and essential oils and tinctures to stimulate the scalp and improve the quality of the hair. It's very labor intensive, but it, it does work. And if you're looking for more shine in your hair, you can use the yellow chamomile essential oil. It really softens and makes your hair, hair shiny. You have to be careful not to use a heat appliance though on it if you put an oil in because you'll just fry it. <laughs> Don't put your hair in a hot, oily place. <laughs> um, you can also put chamomile oil with salt and baking soda. That'll lighten your hair pretty naturally. Um, if you put it in for an hour and then sit in the sun, it'll, it'll actually lighten your hair. Um, so this is uh, chamomilla nobilis, that's the yellow kind. Um, cedar wood oil actually stimulates hair follicles for treating the thinning hair and, and various types of alopecia. Um, you can put cedar wood in your conditioner easily. I love the smell of cedar wood. It's absolutely, again, one of my favorites. Um, and so, I mean, there's so many to choose from. So what's the best carrier oil for putting on your face? Usually the lightest ones, Mare. I, I think um, using like rose hip oil is a nice base for your face. Most people can tolerate like coconut oil and almond. Um, it really depends on your personal preference. Some of them are just a, a touch more sticky um, than, than others. That's why I like rose hip oil. 
So, but you can get away with coconut oil. You can get away with olive oil, frankly. It's just um, doesn't absorb in as nicely as some of the finer oils do. I also like sea buckthorn oil as a carrier. Very, very anti-inflammatory. Um, relatively easy to, to get a hold of. Um, you can use neem oil. Um, that has a lot of um, beauty benefits and it can be easily used as a carrier and it's traditionally used in Ayurveda for hair and skin and nails. So lots of op opportunity there. So you can also use essential oils for improving detox efforts. So um, you can use um, a lot of the citrus ones help a lot. So the lungs and the digestive tract and the skin, you know, they're constantly removing toxins, just totally normally. That's, a, you know, um, the natural defense mechanism against toxicity. So you can use lemon essential oil that helps to stimulate the body, especially in the respiratory functions. Um, same with grapefruit, again, internally, metabolically, you can use it to water and just add it to your water and it just helps to improve your detoxification. Um, peppermint oil um, improves respiratory function and can kind of clear the breathing a little bit. Um, you have to be a bit careful with peppermint oil topically. Sometimes it's very cooling and you don't want to coat anybody in um, an, a mint oil like that. Rosemary essential oil can be inhaled too. Um, so I, we have a great combo of this in the office. So if I'm using it for detox, I usually just use a combo product um, that has, you know, four or five in, I think this ours has five. So you can always think about it in terms of detox plan. You'll smell so much nicer. <laughs> Essential oils are great for relieving headaches. Um, wintergreen is a great one to relieve a headache when you apply it to your temples. I personally love birch oil for this, birch essential oil. Um, it has natural salicylates in it. Those are aspirin-like compounds. So if you're sensitive to aspirins, um, that won't be the best choice for you. But um, I know that my son, if he ever has a headache, he's always digging in my purse for my birch roll-on <laughs> oil. I always have, I have, I carry a lot of stuff in my purse. I don't know about you guys. Well, hopefully it's not too many guys carrying big purses. They probably wouldn't get very far with that. But us girls, I, I don't know about you. I carry a lot of sub bags in my purse. And one of them, one of them is essential oils. <laughs> Cause you just never know, you know, like I'm always amazed at <laughs> the times where, where you just have to pull that out and use it. Um, Clary Sage will also relieve um, a stress induced headache. If you put it in a diffuser, um, clove oil, um, which is quite anesthetic and you can easily use that applied to the forehead and neck. It's quite a potent headache reliever. Of course, you may have also heard of that in toothaches using clove oil. Um, marjoram essential oils will help headaches if you have them from colds um, or fevers. And you know you can use more than one kind. It doesn't always just have to be one kind of oil in your diffuser or in your in your mix. I think the a lot of the time with mixing, it's just a question of, are you gonna get a mixture that smells so hideous that you can't stand it yourself? <laughs> That's always a thing. It, it takes a little bit of time to figure out how to blend it so that you get a nice blend instead of just kind of a bunch of discordant notes that are interfering with each other. Um, you can also promote sleep with essential oils. Um, it You know, sleep is really important and it does, if you do lose sleep, I mean, it increases your risk of many other kinds of conditions. So lavender oil is one of the most studied essential oils for sleep. It's quite effective. I mean, it's certainly not gonna knock you out, but it will put the nervous system in a better place. Even if you feel like you don't sleep um, longer, you might sleep better. So putting a couple drops on your pillow before falling asleep can be quite useful. Um, again, vetiver essential oil with that, it has a very interesting, kind of fragrance, but it also promotes restful sleep. Um, Roman chamomile, so the yellow one, along, along. Um, it's kind of got a sedative hypnotic kind of effect. Like I said, that's a strong one to me. It's not my favorite, but some people love it. And bergamot, which is my favorite, one of my favorites, um, all really help people rest as well. And so you can also put a diffuser in your room at bedtime. 
Um, you can fill a small spray bottle with water and a few of each of those and kind of shake it up and mist it onto your pillow if you feel like the drops are a bit overwhelming. Um, I think diffusers are very useful. It's really worth investing in a very good diffuser. Um, you can get cheap diffusers that will just kind of bubble it away in the water. Um, those are okay. There's nothing wrong with them. You certainly just don't get that pure compound into the air in a highly like um, in a tiny droplet that way because water droplets tend to be bigger and so you, you're going to lose some of the subtleties of the various compounds that way. Um, I have this beautiful um, uh, diffuser. I'm using it at the office right now because of the whole waiting room disinfection <laughs> problem because it's highly efficient. You know, it basically um, pumps pure essential oil um, into the environment in a highly um, like in a cool, cool spray. Um, they're they're you probably about $130, $140 to get one like that, but it work, works really well. Um, and I got mine, I got that one from Gary at Ascension Oils. If you've never um, gone over there, he has some beautiful blends of oils. He also has single ones. He's less about the singles. He's more about the kinds of blends that he makes. And he makes some absolutely beautiful blends. That's on Edmonton Trail. Um, and we, we have, um, I, I can't tell you the brand, Christina, the diffusers. I usually trust um, the ones that Ray has. And so if you're looking for a diffuser, you know, let me know. Um, especially if you're thinking about maybe coming to do the essential oils course, because um, we'll be getting our supplies. Um, well, you will be getting supplies for 20% off the retail if you're so inclined. Yeah. If you're like me, like <laughs> there's a whole cabinet of them, they'll be right up everybody's alley. <laughs> so like I said, you can easily use them for sleep. Now, essential oils for pets is a little bit controversial. There are quite a few essential oils that are really not appropriate for pets. Um, but they can benefit if you use the right ones and you use them in the right amounts. I think you should always really heavily dilute them, much, much more dilute than for you. Because what you have to remember is most creatures have much more acute sense of smell than you do. Um, I mean, a dog's sense of smell, I think, is in the order of a minimum of 100,000 times more, more sensitive than yours. So you can just imagine what they smell um, when, they, when they smell that stuff. It's, it's quite marked. So you want to heavily dilute them with water or oil um, and start with just a small amount for your pet and really observe your pet after using essential oils. Um, and don't just like blanket all your pets in essential oils. <laughs> and um, you can apply them to paws, you know, like the surface of paws or a bit under the fur. The only problem is that you, if you don't do it properly, you know, there are essential oils that if an animal gets it in the eye or in the mouth or the nose or a sensitive area and they don't understand that's what you're doing, <laughs> I think it's quite distressing to them. So you don't want to use peppermint. You know, it just it can burn like a mother if you get that up your nose. You can say maybe you could try by sticking up your nose and if it works and you could probably use it on a dog. But high phenol oils are... They just don't work on most pets, like oregano, clove, wintergreen, thyme. You know, the ones that are really like that you would already know are quite strong. Um, don't use citrus oils um, on animals. Um, they're too potent. Um, and usually we don't administer them internally um, in animals. I don't, I think maybe they do overseas. I don't know a lot about using them like that. There's some that'll probably be safe. But remember, these are very potent compounds, and you're talking to the instinctual brain of an animal, and um, they can be quite toxic. I mean, you put enough of an essential oil into somebody, you can have a toxic effect. They are so, so concentrated. Now, granted, it's better than having the Egyptian version in animal fat. <laughs> I can't imagine that would have like smelled all that great for that long. Although they did seem to preserve them well <laughs> over the long haul. <laughs> so some of the ones that are harmful to cats, as an example, um, like we've already talked about some of them, wintergreen, uh, birch oil, I wouldn't put birch oil on that animal, citrus, pine, 
a long and long, too strong. Peppermint, too cooling. Cinnamon, that burns. Oh, that will burn. If you ever accidentally put cinnamon oil on your skin, um, that will that will burn. Um, uh, pennyroyal, clove, eucalyptus, you know, some of the ones that are quite, um, they're quite intense, thyme, oregano. But in cats, you could use things like helichrysum for wound healing or for scars. You can use spearmint, spearmint they can tolerate, frankincense, cardamom is okay, fennel is okay. Um, and generally in, in dogs, like frankincense too, um, can be used. Uh, lavender can be used in dogs. Um, not as much in cats. Well, not as much as in cats. They're also quite, they're quite sensitive to that one. Ginger's good in dogs. Um, myrrh is good in dogs. But again, like you don't want to be putting cinnamon or citrus or peppermint, especially if it's ingested. Um, depends on your dog. You know, some dogs, they'll lick anything off that you put on them <laughs> before they even really have a chance to do anything. They're just so worried about getting it off. And then they in internalize that and like I said, some are too potent. So you want to be careful about what you're using it for um, and use it very dilute. We can go into more details about that in the actual course if you're interested. So again, you know, we're using aromatic applications here. Smell is really overlooked as a method for healing, but it's, it's very powerful physiologically and mentally and emotionally um, to be interacting with your cranial nerves in that way. So there's a direct link to your limbic system. So that's smell and emotion and behavior and memory. And so as a result, you can uplift or invigorate or calm or relax. Um, and when you use a diffuser, um, you can, you know, honestly, a water diffuser is awesome if you're going to use that instead of a Glade plug-in, right? Those plug-ins contain petrochemicals, which are solvents, and they will hold a scent for a very long time. They're very powerful solvents, but they're toxic solvents, and you really should not be inhaling those, and they're so overwhelming. So if you can get ones, um, you can even get paper ones that will just heat slightly, and you can put a couple of drops of essential oil, and they'll heat a small, or they'll scent a small space. Um, and you can also just put them on cotton balls or in the air vents of your car. I have a little plug-in that goes um, in my, um, you know, like the car plug-in. So you can actually have one that will have little papers in it and, and diffuses the scent. Or you can, I have one also on the vent that you can just put it on the paper and it just kind of, as the air passes over it, it, it diffuses it through the car. Um, you can mist it over furniture, carpets, or linens like with a spray and water, you just have to be a bit careful on things that are whiter because some of the essential oils are dark enough to stain. Um, there's also, you know, you can put them on your wool laundry balls. I have wool laundry balls in my dryer. And I don't know if you've seen those, but they're easy to get and you can just put essential oils on them and they make your laundry smell really nice. So topically, you know, they're easily absorbed by the skin. It depends a little bit on where they're applied. You know, so like your foot skin, your hand skin, and the thinner skin, like neck, forehead, temples, um, you can really um, get a lot of that um, into you. But there's some places that are, they're not going to be so great to absorb, like through your leg skin, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where everywhere the, th the skin's a little bit thicker. Um, but where it's thinner, you're going to get more absorption. So you can also put it in with a bath or by a compress or by putting it in your moisturizer that you've already got. Um, just a couple of drops will work. And then, like I said, orally, some of them have rich culinary history. You can use them as dietary supplements for a variety of health conditions. And you can, you could already be ingesting essential oils and you have no idea, <laughs> like, you know, peppermint tea or cinnamon or fresh basil. Those are all aromatics um, that those plants are known for. And so when you ingest them, they can have great health benefits. You know, they're all transported throughout your whole body and they dissolve in fat. So as a fat soluble compound, you can get um, a small amount of essential oils kind of all over the place. So how essential oils react with cells really isn't that clear. I don't know if it's been studied in, in great detail, but um, 
each oil has um, a different composition and they, that's one of the reasons why they offer such unique benefits. So using a drop or two in recipes is useful, especially of the culinary ones. You know, the citrus oils are beautiful and water. Um, adding drops to beverages or yogurt or um, like your fruit, your apple sauces. Um, or like I said, you can go all the way to ingesting it as a capsule, depending on what is going on with you. So really, they're very safe to use as long as you're using reasonable doses. Um, of course, aromatic use is the, safe, the safest, but you, you just don't want your pet like trapped in a room with that it can't get away from the diffuser because cats especially, you know, they, they might leave the room if they don't like the smell or if it's irritating and you should let your animal be able to escape <laughs> because they know better than you sometimes. And topically, dilute them to avoid skin irritation. We've already talked about that. You can even put them in aloe vera gel. You know, if you had a sunburn, that would be great. Um, and you can ingest them in small doses, like, like I was saying, again, you probably don't want to do it repetitively all the time. Um, if there's a problem that you're doing that repetitively all the time, you need to look at different ways of dealing with it. A little ones, um, under six probably shouldn't ingest them unless they're quite infected. Um, and like we were saying before, keep all the bodies, uh, the bottles closed and cool away from direct sunlight. Um, don't stick it up your your in your eye. I've accidentally put cassia essential oil in my in my eye. It's very similar to cinnamon. Bad idea. That was like brutal. It was totally by accident. And certainly choose high quality essential oils. So hydrosols have different effects, Sandy. Um, there are some hydrosols that are absolutely brilliant for use um, and are preferable in the hydrosol. Um, a rose hydrosol is definitely a cheaper alternative to rose oil. It won't be as therapeutic um, because, again, that's the water fraction. So you're not really getting a ton of essential oil in there. However, there's something in the hydrosol, um, like one that I always use in my office is green myrtle hydrosol. That is a hydrosol that is totally safe to put in your eye. And I use that for conjunctivitis or eye irritations, welding burn. Um, when people accidentally stick something in their eye and scratch the cornea, it's brilliant, brilliant hydrosol. And hydrosols can be used as very nice bases for things. Um, in traditional bug spray, um, I actually make one in, in the office that's like cypress and um, I love cypress oil for, for bug spray. And I use a little bit of glycerin and witch hazel and a kind of suspension of a multiple different like catnip oil and multiple different other oils that I know are pretty potent for bugs. Um, if you ask me later, Sharon, I can't remember exactly. It's been a while since I looked at my own recipe, you know? <laughs> I make it, you know, once or twice a year and then I forget about it until the next year. So maybe ask me about that later. I can take a look for you. Uh, lemon eucalyptus, yeah, that can totally stand up. It depends a little bit on the bugs and the person and, and how well it stays on your skin. Um, that's why I often use the glycerin to kind of stick it on the surface of your skin. Um, let's see. And um, I'm just being asked, can we get supplies? Yeah, if you're gonna take the course with me, I'm gonna show you the course actually. I think that might be the next slide. So we're gonna do about three hours worth of learning in August on essential oils. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of these issues in much more detail and then really, really detail down which oils do what in, in all of these, um, different categories. So we're going to talk much more about like what exactly is an essential oil. I didn't really have a chance to tell, tell you about that today as, as usual. I'm like with this particular kind of thing I'm running over and I, I know, um, Everybody's so curious and you just want to have a sense of, of how to use it for yourself. But I think if you're at all inclined, um, come come and take the course. It'll be fun. Even if you can't make it in the evenings that we're doing it, well, we're going to do replays. Um, and so I'm just going to put up the, um, put up the a sticky message with the link that'll take you to that. Hopefully you'll be able to, to grab that and just where I placed where you can register for that course. And it should be super fun. Um, and then I will 
in the course, I'm going to just give people a list of things that we're going to talk about in the course. And, you know, if there's other ones that you're interested in having as well, if I can get them from my supplier, like I said, we're going to offer people 20% off of that. So if you really want to, um, you know, improve your essential oil collection, this is a way to do it. And then also to learn really how to use it in the most proper way. So we're going to talk about all of these things. Um, and it, oh my gosh, I love essential oils. And you can certainly have these beautiful, you know, things that just improve, like just kind of create beautiful scents. I almost always wear essential oil perfume. Um, I think the boys in my like, life like it. What do you say, Baxter? <laughs> my yeah. son's not. He, he, he. Uh, they always like hug me and are like, "Oh, you smell so nice." So they're used to it. So there's some beautiful recipes that you can make. I think. Um, uh, I made you a couple. Um, what do I think of Young Living as a brand? I think they're great. I think they can be um, a little spendy, but they have be some beautiful blends. Um, absolutely beautiful blends. And I was going to actually put a couple up here for you. Hmm. My son is hand feeding me snacks. I like that. Okay, so I'm just going to type out a couple. I'm going to see how this comes out on your end. Might be bad. <laughs> oh no, it's not too bad. Okay, so there's a couple of blends that you can use that are just beautiful scents for your environment. I mean, I think it's so lovely when your house smells. And um, actually one of my son's friends came over the other day and he, he walked in the house and he's like, your house always smells so nice. And it's because of essential oils because we're always pumping them around and using them. So here's a couple of the things that you can use. The man cave one is especially good for boys. <laughs> So I just, I know I just went over a ton of information. Um, I mean, the gist is that essential oils offer a lot of benefits. So, you know, feel free to play around with them, ask questions about them. Hopefully you'll come and, and join our course so that we can be much more detailed about exactly how to use it. Um, I hope you're going to be excited about getting started with it. I really um, hope you've had a wonderful time and you have some new ideas about how you might use the ones that perhaps you already have. Um, you know, even to make your own little spa bowl here like this person is doing. And then again, I'm just going to put up the course information. I hope you have a chance um, to join me. It's, it's such a rich topic area and you'll find some beautiful favorites and ones that you've never heard of before that I didn't even get a chance to talk about today but I'll share my contents of my essential oil cabinet with you. And so I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. I love to connect to my patient community to inform and inspire. And I hope you'll join us again in the near future. Don't forget to check out whole-life-medicine.com for more webinars and events.